Welcome back to World War Now, everybody. I'm your host, Conrad Franz, joined, as always, by Dmitry Kalyagin. This is episode 38. We're coming at you on this Saturday. It's been a huge week with things going on in Africa, in Russia, in the Black Sea, in Australia, of all you know, things people talk about cashless societies, coups are being over undertaken. The U.S. is talking about invading more countries. Uh, things are really, really getting crazy out there. Dmitry, how are you doing? Yeah, doing great, Conrad. It's good to be here. Lots of detailed news. Unlike last week, there was really a lot of cramming that occurred. But this week, you know, a lot of these issues are really flushed out. And it's almost like a continue episode, continuation episode from episode 37. So in a way, these two really go back to back. And definitely a lot of detail. Um, the, yeah, the world situation is is heating up, as always. But, you know, it's just getting a bit more complex. And definitely we're touching on a few more continents than usual, not just Europe and Asia. But definitely we're in the African theater, and that's what we'll be discussing. And, of course, uh, towards the end of the episode, there are a lot of updates on the church in Ukraine, just the church in Romania as well, and r the Russian situation, which if anybody's interested in Orthodox Christianity or exactly what's happening in that world of ecclesiology, and I suppose you could call it... Um, you know, colloquially speaking, church politics, we'll be discussing that as well towards the end. Now, like I said, big episode, and I'm coming at you from on the road. I'm in South Carolina. I think Dimitri, he has a bit of a new setup, so we're all, we're big new things are happening everywhere here in the, in the studio, as it's called. So we're excited to be with you today. But yeah, I mean, the World War stuff, I mean, again, we don't, sure, maybe we're, we have a bias towards World War Three here on World War Now, as we're called, but I think if you just, from an objective standpoint, I think I mean, really is, this is an episode kind of about vindication as well, because we are, our thesis has been very, very vindicated. And I made a post on Telegram, I'm sure a lot of you saw it, be sure to follow us on Telegram, World War Now Telly. But I made a post about kind of all of the hot fronts and what is like how everywhere in the world is in almost all regions is heating up in regards to in relation to the Russia Ukraine conflict. You know, you have Russia Ukraine itself, you have the Caucasus, you have Syria, you have the Holy Land with Palestine, Israel, and I would argue even the Christian forces and, you know, the Christian groups there facing persecution. And now, of course, you have West Africa with talks of invasion and everything. I think all of those are things you could consider hot, active battlefields in the Third World War. And then you have the whole Belarus, Poland, Baltics issues, the issues in Serbia, Kosovo, Serbska, China, Taiwan, Turkey and Greece, North Korea. And then I would argue even China, India and the Himalayas. These are all conflicts that I think at any moment, based on the geopolitical machinations of the United States, their soft power wings around the world, and perhaps even other nefarious actors involved in the in the Western Atlanticist project, these are places that then can be pushed and pressed to then have another, another conflict erupt. And again, I believe both sides are lighting fires where they see it strategically fit. Russia's lighting fires in Africa. They're driving out France and by default more U.S. influence. And the U.S. is lighting fires in Syria. The U.S. is lighting fires in Taiwan because these are places that where, you know, Russia, China, the landed powers the multipolar powers would see more interest in, I guess, having peace reign for now so that they can stock up their supplies so that when they do make a political, military, or hybrid move, they're in a better position, but the U.S. is then accelerating conflicts there. So the World War III thesis is totally vindicated, but I think we're going to start in Niger. I think that's probably the best place to really start this off because, again, we talked last episode, and I don't want to say I was wrong, but I did say that it doesn't seem like there will be an invasion. France seems to be stepping aside, doesn't want to get involved militarily. And sure, France itself may not be getting involved militarily, but I did underestimate the extent to which the U.S. would use its power to pressure the Africans to move in themselves with Nigeria, Benin, and these Togo, some of these other countries in ECOWAS, which is the uh, economic community of West African states that this part of Niger is part of the Sahel region. And it seems now that some are saying it's a bluff. I'm hearing that from some Russian sources, but others have released even documents showing preparations for a Nigerian invasion of Niger, which, again, Nigeria is obviously by far the most powerful regional actor, one of the most populated countries in the world. Hundreds of millions of people, you know, actually somewhat influential economy just based on how many people are there. So this is all fascinating. Of course, Mali, Burkina Faso, and even Guinea have pledged a level of support, including with Mali and Burkina Faso, military support for Niger in the event that it's invaded by one of its neighbors that's aligned with the West. So, Dimitri, I want to hear your thoughts on this growing situation. We've heard that Wagner is on the ground in some of these, in some of these countries. Is that correct? 
I think there are definitely Wagner advisors or at least some personnel on a very local level in Niger at the moment. And the, the Russian Federation has actually reopened its uh, embassy for the first time in Niger. I'm not, I couldn't actually find any information as to where, when the Russian Federation or the Soviet Union perhaps has closed its embassy in Niger, because that was one of the growing theories was, well, uh, the, the, the current president of Niger, and this is perhaps one of the most uh, you know interesting news of the week, is perhaps allegedly an Orthodox Christian, right? The current uh, dictator, or I guess he came to power, but he's a, the president of Niger, General Tiani, is allegedly an Orthodox Christian who was baptized either in 1981 or 1983 through his ties to the Russian Soviet singer Vasilyevna and the Soviet embassy, which uh, had an actual, um, had some Orthodox priest, Orthodox uh, Christian connections. So very interesting. So the possible Orthodox angle behind all of this Russian Orthodox black African general who just had a coup situation here. Very rare and unusual, but that's kind of a side story, which there is not much evidence. It's simply that one of the former political advisors of Putin actually threw this version out, uh, Professor Sergei Markov. So uh, nevertheless, uh, we kind of continue with the news. So, of course, in content, contextually speaking, Africa has had 94 coups since 1952. So since World War II, since the establishment of the United Nations, Africa, the continent itself, has been incredibly unstable. What occurred in the last two weeks is no, is, is nothing new, really. Niger is the, the thing that makes this particular issue, I suppose, uh, more important than the previous coups is that there is an ongoing global Cold War, of course, escalating into a heated World War III-like scenario. There's never been a level of confrontation as we've seen here, not at least for the last 30, perhaps 40 years, probably since the um, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, I can say, right? Uh, for the first time, the nuclear clock, actually, when Prigozhin drove his tanks at Moscow, was so close to midnight, and I think closer than uh, since, um, since that crisis in Cuba. So essentially, the world is watching what's going on around the world, and for the first time, we see uh, Africa appear kind of on the map, and of course this uh, heated conflict affects, to a large extent, the, the Western powers m much more negatively than it does the Eastern powers. And by Eastern powers, I mean primarily China and Russia, who are the two Eastern superpowers who have the most influence in Africa on the continent, on the ground itself. Now, primarily, of course, people are blaming Wagner for being involved in Niger. I think it's probably a local coup to begin with. Whether or not Niger will, of course, intervene in some capacity, maybe through their Central African uh, Republic ties, um, we're not sure. But again, the story is developing, and it kind of does align with the recent PSYOP potential of Prigozhin, as well as Wagner, kind of Russia washing its hands off of Wagner and saying, look, you guys can go to Africa or Belarus. We don't want you here anymore. You guys are unofficially traitors. And of course, Prigozhin meeting all the African leaders in St. Petersburg recently in the last week and a half has kind of cemented this idea that perhaps Wagner will be used as this um, unofficial source of Russian influence in foreign co continents, whereas in Russia can, and of course Putin loves his uh, political legitimacy claims and of course that he follows international laws. He really, that is the image that he's put forward over the over the last few decades. So it kind of pushes that, that whole narrative of, well, Russia has never intervened in African countries or Asian countries or anywhere else in Central Asia or Ukraine, but Wagner has, and Wagner isn't Russia. It's simply a, a PMC, an unofficial corporation corporation run by this madman Prigozhin. So that's basically the potential um, escalation point from the Russian side. It could be through the Wagner group, which, I mean, at that point, all bets are off because Wagner at this point is one of the most powerful military corporations on earth, you know, probably equivalent to G4S or uh, Blackwater or uh, what was its, its Blackwater's new name? Um, it wasn't Illuminati, it was something of that sort. But uh, the in terms of the major PMCs around the world, of course, G4S being the largest, over 800,000 employees uh, from the great, from Great Britain, of course, prison guards, etc., security guards of various sorts, and even doctors and their own nurses. So it's quite an interesting development having Wagner be involved in this. It hasn't been, of course, uh, determined at this point, but if there is a military escalation and Wagner does become you know, uh, kind of intertwined here. Uh, this is, uh, things Things may get quite heated. No, it's true what you say about Wagner and Russia and that situation and how it's kind of an unshackling perhaps of Wagner that they can now act with somewhat some impunity around the world and just receive, in their minds at least, in the eyes of the public, just receive funds from pro-Russian regimes and then they go in and help them because, you know, that's just business, right? But, you know, we see these Russian flags being waved in the streets of Niamey, which is the capital of Niger, which unfortunately for a military situation is right on the border with Nigeria. But I think it's funny you see all these Russian flags. Like, don't these Russians, don't these... Ne I think it's also funny the demonyms for these countries. You remember, for Nigeria, they're called Nigerians, but for Niger, they're Nigerians. 
And instead of I-A-N at the end, it's I-E-N. So, you know, everybody keep up with that. I give Niger a lot of credit. They've got one of the most aesthetic flags. You know, I, personally, I think you could come up with a, with, a, with a more distinct demonym, but I think any, that would be too, uh, it would be too comedically offensive, I guess, if they didn't have Nigerian or, I'm sorry, this is pretty funny, but I want to know where are these Africans, I want, I think it's just funny, I want to know where these Africans even get these Russian flags, like what Russian agents on the ground are like handing these things out, but I was going to say, don't they know that this is a Belarusian operation? You know, they need to be waving that, that, that red and green, you know, because as far as if there were, if this is supposed to be, if this is a coup that the international community is going to call Russian back, you know, that's misinformation. This is clearly a Belarusian coup. And we are seeing the birth of Belarusian, the Belarusian empire <laughs> with the, you know, Belarusian expansion. I'm, I'm, you know, joking, of course, but this is, um, like you said, these protests, all, everyone on the ground in any of these African countries, almost without exception, uh, even including the countries that are very pro-America, pro-West with their regimes, they're going to be pro-Russian in these situations. They've seen what's happened in Uganda. The head of, president of Uganda, despite you know Uganda being a very relevant, somewhat more westernized African country in some regards, they were just in Russia at the big African thing, and they've been you know at a in a war basically with the U.S. over their outlawing of homosexuality and its strict punishments and everything, and. They, they realize, you know, that this Russia-Ukraine war is, a, is very much about all of that stuff. And that leads into kind of our broader discussion of what's going on here. And this, there's a lot of, been a lot of discourse about Africa and about kind of if you're a Westerner, or I guess a white person who I guess is anti-globalist or supports multipolarity or something like what is your stance on the, you know, the kind of growth of these African regimes and the presence of them on the side of anti-globalism, on the side of anti-Atlanticism, anti-NATOism. And we see people like the MAGA communists going full kind of anti-white, denying genocide of the Boer people in South Africa, and these sorts of things. Whereas you see others on the other side, you know, the more pro-white, pro-Western side, not necessarily people that are pro-NATO, but just people that are like America first, people that are nationalists in countries like Germany, France they are a lot more skeptical of all of that because they see a lot of the what you could call anti-white grievance politics being used by i mean i'll say it regimes that do enjoy some russian support due to their alignment against the west and i think here on this show as usual we break these dialectics we do not allow the erection of false dialectics here it's why we don't push you know things like the denazification meme too far and i just have to say that on the one hand, I think some of these Western people, these nationalists, should be glad that Russia is taking over some of these countries. Because, look, sure, the elites in your countries may are going to try their best to flood your country with third world immigrants, regardless of, you know, where they come from. But for a situation like France and even the UK and some of these other places, if the former colony is fully severed from the empire, from the central nexus, whether that's, you know, Paris, London the government has less of a pretext to ship these people into your country. Like, oh, you know, these people, were, we colonized them. They're part of the British family. They're part of the French family. We need to let them in. Like, no, if these countries are just fully severed, they're, they're African, they're looking for African unions or they're pro-Russian or whatever it is, like even your liberal country may see a reason to restrict immigration from those places. So I think the decoupling of these countries explicitly from this kind, especially because we know that this, there's nothing based about this current iteration of the post-colonial kind of holdings of, of France in these places. And I'm not saying that they should voluntarily divest. I'm just saying from this perspective of migration and anti-white animus, I think it's not, this isn't just a bad thing. And again, sure, some of the places like you know some of the people being propped up like the head of burkina faso the head of central african republic you know these places that wagner has assisted in overthrowing their pro-french leadership places like mali there is a lot of anti-colonial rhetoric you know it's not as not a lot of it is quite as anti-white as what you see in south africa but you know it just makes sense it's, it's politics like that and a lot of these countries i can't hold it against them for seeing the degeneracy in the west you know like they these countries now probably know that they're going to be much stronger in their attempts to pass legislation resisting, you know, sodomy and things like that. But then when it comes to South Africa, you know, you see the EFF leader, Julius Malema, chanting, you know, kill the boar, kill the white farmer, while at the same time tweeting and denouncing anti-Semitism. Because at a fundamental level, he is a, you know, global communist who serves, you know, just as 
again, like these, the, the alignments all get mixed up because as we've talked about in our ether hours about the Russian elite, there are, you know, very powerful people that see, you know, something more akin to like Jewish communism as something to be spread around the world from a Russian perspective. You know, these are holdovers from Soviet times, holdovers from the nineties. What we unfortunately don't see, and Dimitri can elaborate, are holdovers from the Russian imperial era, which again, that's kind of the position that we seek to establish, you know, fundamentally anti-globalist, anti-Atlanticist, you know, teleurocratic, you know, advancing the cause of the third Rome while at the same time though, I mean, Dimitri, you can enlighten us. What, what did Tsar Nicholas II, and you could even say Putin as an extension to this himself based on some of the comments he's made, what is the perspective on, on the Boer? Well, uh, during the Boer War, when the, uh, the British Empire was really pressuring uh, these Dutch settlers and essentially these Boers who were very similar to Russian Cossacks in a way, like living out in the farms, very free, freedom loving, essentially, and also cooperating with the local African tribes on their own terms, essentially. So just saying, look, we don't want to be part of this huge capitalistic British Empire. We want to kind of be independent and just live out here and not really subject ourselves to your rule. And of course, they fought against the British Empire. In fact, in uh, 1899, in those wars, right this is about 15 years before World War One. This is when concentration camps were actually invented for the first time in human history, which were used against the Boers in order to uh, enclose the families of the Boers, because essentially the Boer War was very heavy uh, guerrilla warfare. No, I mean, no reference to the literal guerrillas living in Africa, but it was a guerrilla warfare where um, the, the Boers would hide in bushes and in the, uh, the African terrain, which they knew, and they fought against the British very effectively in that capacity. And so the only way the British could defeat them was, of course, to raid the Boer villages, take their wives, children, uh, and elderly folk, and of course, place them into concentration camps. And once the war, guerrilla warfare fighters would be, uh, once they were discovered, their families were captured, they would, of course, submit to the British rule. And so that's how the Boer War ended. But there were Russian volunteers from the empire in, in those early days, and even um, of course, who participated on the side of the Boers, not the British uh, Empire. And interestingly enough, St. Nicholas II even wrote in his diaries how the Boers, you know, they kind of had this very romantic theme about them. And he really spoke highly of them personally amongst friends and even in his diaries, you can read them. The St. Nicholas's diaries are, of course, the early diaries are the best preserved. Those diaries, of course, during, I think towards the end of World War One, there are some questions as to their particular legitimacy, but those investigations are still ongoing. Nevertheless, we kind of saw this, you mentioned holdovers from the Soviet times and those ideas of, you know, uh, decolonization, that sort of international relations sort of theme of uh, giving the black people back their freedom around the world, etc. This this theme, of course, is still present in Russian foreign policy, but what, what is also present is this idea of, well, this Russian imperial sort of, well, let's give these white Christian people a place to live. In 2018, we saw a, a large invitation go out to all these Boer uh, Africana families from Vladimir Putin and the Russian Kremlin, which was very interesting. Um, it didn't necessarily eventuate into anything. There were allegedly 15,000 Boers and Afrikaners who wanted to travel from South Africa to Russia to uh, you know, Crimea, because this is 2018, so Crimea was actually quite free uh, at the time, and it was quite peaceful, actually, 2018 at that time. And of course, uh, places like Krasnodar, uh, Kaluga, etc., just around Western Russia, because there's so much farmland in those particular areas, which is essentially unmanaged, and the Boers are exceptionally good at farming, especially those farmers from the South African region who have the money to travel overseas. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't really eventuate. Um, there was only several hundred Boers who actually settled uh, in Russia and who currently live around these areas, but they, they, that big project kind of died in 2018, unfortunately, probably because of sanctions or just the Russian Kremlin didn't really follow up. It was maybe just a big PR stunt. So um, that's that's really unfortunate on that end because really Putin and, and his uh, fellows in the United Russia could have continued that legacy of the Russian Empire supporting Christian Europeans around the world, kind of those who are exceptionally you know, downtrodden, especially in places like South Africa by the, uh, the black majority and essentially uh, black supremacist powers that run the country over there. And these communists who've seen kill the Boer, of course, that's an even worse power. And no doubt, as we've seen from my debate with Haas and Conrad's debate with Haas, these, uh, the communism essentially is anti-Orthodox as well at its core, which is why they have these different views on Israel and all of those uh, sensitive subjects, as well as um, perhaps anti-European views, anti-Romanov views. They hate the Russian Empire. They hate everything that came before the Soviet Union. So it's a very biased opinion. And here we do see eye to eye with the Afrikaners and the Boers. I think that's 
something a future Russian Kremlin, a future Russian superpower could assist the white people of Africa with, you know, a place to kind of stay and bring their wealth. And at that time in 2018, Conrad, they actually estimated each Boer family would bring roughly 500,000 American dollars into the Russian economy, which for Russia, 500,000 USD could purchase you not just acreage, but also the equipment to actually run a proper farm and, you know, either have livestock or agriculture or do whatever actually and just uh, earn yourself a living and that would improve the russian ecosystem but uh, unfortunately that project never really came to pass and so today we kind of see this again this reversion to uh, this uh, international denazification and recommunization in, in a way um has kind of taken over the narrative again and we do see these characters like Haas infrared and jackson hinkle of course push this narrative of like well maoism stalinism that's what putin stands for that's not really the theme we've been seeing since the beginning of um the smo in fact that's i think kind of like a, a dead a, you know almost like a dead theme of the pre donbass war for the pre-2014 era of where uh, everything had to be about stalin and about this about the world war ii whereas now we're in this new Novorossiya, this russian spring scenario where russia's returning back to its roots i don't think that communist sort of rhetoric floats anymore not in russia not even abroad i don't think anybody wants to be praising stalin or mao or any of these anti-christian uh anti anti-white black politicians it's just not gonna uh, it's just not going to float anywhere. I'm not amongst the our community in the Orthodox Church. Not not even amongst the the right wing circles in Europe and America. Yeah, I mean, this is the silly stuff about you know the the, the MAGA communist stuff. I mean, do these people not realize they're just boomers? But like the Russian version, just because they live in the West, they think that their positions are for young people and edgy. It's like no, you're like the boomer conservative, boomer libtard equivalent in Russia. Like you hold the opinion that like Russian boomers that low-key like believe the television that's all they believe that's your position Haas and jackson so sorry about that and again like with all this stuff in about south africa like of course these communist idiots are going to support white genocide and deny it in south africa just like they supported the genocide of the kulaks and the murder of you know the you know the orthodox you know landed gentry and the orthodox landed you know middle class in russia i mean it's the same thing that's happening it's these indiscriminate murders by these you know black breathed workers and a lot of times they don't even steal anything they just kill the local farmer because they view him as a landowner and because he's a landowner he is oppressive and look i'm sorry it's not it's not our fault that these people in these countries can't grow food at scale okay we all saw what happened to zimbabwe they're begging the white people to come back and look i i don't think they should the only thing i support in this country is i, I support armed wagner around Arania, you know the the protected boar only town that's the that's the kind of, you know, Russian intervention I support. And I do believe that, you know, if more, I think more and more of these Afrikaners should reach out and maybe Russia can reignite the resettlement in the South, because I think that would be very valuable. I'd much rather have those people in the South than, you know, frankly, some of the Dagestani, you know, Chechens that we already have there. So as far as empire building, I think it would be a smart decision. But yeah, I mean, look, Haas, you're not white. I understand that like, I can't necessarily hold this one against you for like not not being here but jackson hinkle come on man you gotta step it up stand up for your people this isn't this isn't based you can steal our content we're not going to get mad at you for that but let's not you know let's not just throw the whole white race under the bus man well and speaking about throwing the white race under the bus i mean the european union right now is facing an enor enormous pressure not just from within where we saw the you know the, of course the riots in france which are, are dying down at the moment but now somebody has to pay for all the destruction and the, the people paying right won't be the brown and the black residents the the muslims the immigrants it'll be the the white catholic french christians the hard-working taxpayers of france who will be paying for these thousands of public buildings which the protesters destroyed over the last few months right i mean that's the irony of it all this is just the middle class will be of course subjected to all this and we remember the yellow vest protests and how hardcore they were and of course the COVID lockdowns which weren't popular in europe and france and again it's just a lot of pressure and right this whole niger scenario in africa is just going to hit france the hardest because listen niger imports 35 to 38 percent of its uranium from uh from niger so france actually receives the majority of its uh electricity production from uranium through its uh, 18 or so electrical stations and namely like we have to keep in mind that this particular hit and niger of course officially announcing that look we're going to eventually stop all export of uranium to france under under no pretext whatsoever that's just what they believe they need to do because france is the colonial country and look myself and conrad we understand this is geopolitics this is a benefit 
I, I suppose, four Eastern powers like Russia and China for those fighting against, uh, you know, the EU, NATO, because France, of course, is one of the figurehead leaders of NATO. It's a nuclear power. So in fact, a weakening, a weakened France uh, is precisely kind of works right in, in Russia's favor at this point. And France is getting hit very hard by this particular, or will be hit very soon, similar to how Germany wasn't initially hit by the Nord Stream 1 explosion, whoever caused that terrorist act, or question marks last year in October. But of course, Germany's energy prices in 2023 rose up four times. So the electricity is roughly four times the price it was last year in Germany. And imagine what's going to happen in France now that uranium is being cut by about 40%. Again, electricity is going to go up, and France at the moment is exporting some of this gas to Germany. So it's kind of it's if the EU is built on these two pillars, like of this Masonic temple. One of the pillars, the left one, is France. The right one is Germany. And Germany got hit hard last year. Now France, of course, is being impacted. And again, there's questions around things such as the the gas pipeline going for Africa. So there's a massive gas pipeline uh, from the coast of Africa going through Nigeria, through Niger and Algeria north, and through, of course, the Mediterranean Sea into Spain. And this is called the Trans-Saharan. Um, Trans-Saharan gas line. Although the interesting thing about this gas line is it's just a slightly, it's about 25, 35% smaller than uh, the Nord Stream in terms of cubic cubic meters, exactly how much gas it translates over an annual period. So it's not exactly as big as Nord Stream, but still any gas that, you know, stops going into Europe at this point, especially with winter coming up, it'll be, it'll be a tremendous sort of hit on France. And namely the, the, the French company Arriva has already announced it's pausing all of its, uh, uranium collection in in the region of niger at the moment since the coups since the coup began in uh, on the 26th of july so there's uh, there's definitely a lot of developments going on there and it kind of all ties together we spoke about the kazakhstan coup in 2019 conrad recall when kazakhstan had its own mini internal coup and in a way a very pro-eastern power pro-eastern president came to power in astana so uh nur sultanov so he essentially he essentially has pivoted kazakhstan more towards Russia and China, rather away from this United States European, uh, European from the European United States direction. Why this is important is because again, it's a question of uranium. Kazakhstan produces probably close to fifty percent of all the world's uranium on an annual basis, so close to twenty five thousand tons every year. So the rest of the world, of course, Niger produces a very small amount, only roughly between four thousand and five thousand tons a year. Which you may say, like, oh, that's nothing. Look at Kazakhstan, twenty five k, but. There is this that consideration. Niger is the closest uranium producer to France. It's literally under France's. It's part of France's, you know, capitalistic empire essentially. And now it's been suddenly uh, placed, you know, set on fire locally and perhaps even externally by forces such as Russia or China. So again, the French are heavily hit by this particular, you know, but but this particular issue. Of course, sixty percent of France's other uranium is imported from Kazakhstan, Canada, and Australia. So eventually um eventually france will maybe recover or even increase its imports but at this point we're looking at a very tough winter for the french and in fact for the entire european union which benefits russia because hey the european union has officially almost announced its uh its military you know it's 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 its allegiance to nato and kind of announced its um confrontation with russia because it has been sending aid to the ukraine over a year and a half now so at this point it's almost like well You've announced yourself as the enemy, and now everything's kind of uh, all cards are on the table. We can play, we can play this in very in very different ways. And if you you know, we usually refer to the, we refer to this World War Three scenario. You know, we can call it something like the Soul Wars because it is like a battle for souls of people around the world. It's this battle of you know traditionalism, Christianity against this degenerate neoliberalism spreading. And of course, I think it's also the energy wars because you know, we began the podcast. If anybody recalls. At the beginning of the mobilization last year in uh, early October, late September, and of course the second episode we spoke about the Nord Stream pipeline because that's when the terrorist attack occurred. And in fact, so the entire podcast kind of uh, it does have this touch of energy policy around it. It's very very energy based, and I think this is no different. Of course, gas pipelines, uranium exports, it's very much centered around that. And you know, at this point, that's one of the major themes as to why Niger is even important. It's not because the country has some sort of, it's not because France wants to import, you know, the citizens of Niger or that's kind of, uh, if, if anything, like Conrad mentioned, that's almost like a, a side effect of France's energy policies is that, you know, uh, people from Niger can actually immigrate to France in sm small quantities, of course, but nevertheless, and the demographics of France will change over time. But the main consideration, of course, here is energy, which uh, at the moment is, in huge strife. Yeah, it's so true. We it, we always do focus on the energy stuff here because that's part, that's always kind of the first covert level look. We're not like these 
kind of normie libcoms who say like, oh, I'm, I'm red pilled for thinking the US went into Iraq for the oil. It's like, yeah, we went to Iraq for the oil for Israel, bro, like get it straight. But yeah, I mean, energy is so key to all of this. And the Nord Stream pipeline is kind of the nexus that all of these other nodes stem out of because the US is like, well, dang, we got away with this. So they basically feel they can act with impunity on pipelines, on gas fields, on oil fields around the world. So expect a lot more of that. But before we move on from Niger, I just want to make sure everyone's aware of the situation on the ground. There's basically a standoff going on right now as countries, certain countries pledge to invade. Certain uh, There's sources saying that the US and the UK are willing to invade if they see Wagner fighting on the ground in Niger. The country of Chad next door has said they're not going to invade despite still being more France aligned. So all of that is is being watched very closely. And again, like any kind of US intervention would be massive. Of course, the US isn't really afraid to intervene in Africa. It's They're able to do all sorts of things with way less people than compared to countries like the Middle East. So it's uh, it's really anybody's guess up at, at this point. It seems that there is a good chance that it's a bluff. I would be surprised. It's a, you know, there's been some restraint around the world in World War III in some regards, ever since Ukraine has started and the pullback that's had to go on. But you know, if they really are willing to go in for Niger, I think that's proof that this snowball has gotten so big that they're they're getting afraid. But Dimitri, unless you have any last words on Africa, I think a good way to pivot is towards Belarus and Wagner and what's going on on the Polish border. Yeah, I only want to fix my mistake. I did say the, uh, it's not, of, of course, Nazarbayev is no longer the president of Kazakhstan. It's Takayev, the really pro-Chinese, um, you know, slightly anti-Russian president of Kazakhstan. So uh, Former acolyte of Nazarbayev, so understandable. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And he essentially turned against his master in a very like Star Wars, a geeky type fashion in 2019. When, of course, uh, this doesn't benefit France at all because now Kazakhstan you know, is essentially a, a puppet of China, Russia, and France still depends on its uh, imports from there. So, of course, it's kind of sweating there on the side. But yeah, naturally speaking, I, I think all these threats of Mali and Burkina Faso joining into the fray and supporting Niger against Nigeria and ECOWAS and perhaps even a French foreign legion in, in intervention is uh, perhaps overstated because just the militaries of these smaller countries in the Sahel region as well as south of that are not very powerful. Now, of course, they are majority Muslim, so there is something that ties most of these militaries together. But you have to consider France does have its elite foreign legion troops stationed nearby. I mean, close to 2,000 troops at the ready. The United States has at least 1,000 troops. And even Georgia has several hundred troops in Mali, actually, of all places, which, you know, Georgia is an Orthodox country, so there are several hundred uh, Georgian Orthodox uh, troops there from Afghanistan, I think, of all places, because Georgia actually had close to 900 troops in Afghanistan at some point, assisting, essentially paying off its military debt to the United States by saying that, look, yeah, sure, we'll send our troops to, I think they sent um, an entire battalion to Afghanistan over between 2004 and 2014. But yeah, very interesting. And we just have to keep in mind, a lot of these coups occur in Africa over the years, as we said, almost 100 over the last 70 odd years. So uh, and the reason this one's important is because uh, one is the energy situation around the world, and two, it's a potential second front to the ongoing war. Of course, uh, the third front being the Middle East, this first being Europe, second being Africa. In Asia, of course, we haven't really seen an escalation, but normally how these world wars go, and if you if you know your history, World War One and Two were officially labeled, I suppose, as world wars when they kind of did you know expand into Africa. Of course, World War One when the German colonies began. Started, you know, started to get attacked by France and the UK. I think mostly the British Empire and World War Two, of course, with Rommel and his uh, and the Italians, of course, c capturing North Africa and of course fighting the British there and fighting over Egypt and Israel, Palestine, all those regions there. So that is there's something we have to consider. As soon as Africa becomes a hot spot of conflict, there is that again. And in history books will be looking back and saying, look, this is when things kind of went from a regional European confrontation to a more global through a more global conflict perhaps it will be like a a widespread world war three type scenario over many over many years perhaps decades it, it is a new again they call it hybrid wars but yeah it's definitely different to what we've seen before yeah i know that people don't know too much about this and i even forgot to mention this in my hot fronts post but there are some hot conflicts in asia i mean myanmar is in the middle of a low-grade insurgency right now the u.s is directly funding just local militant groups giving them automatic weapons and they're just running up on police stations because the police and the local Myanmar military junta are so closely aligned and of course the Myanmar military junta is very much aligned with China because in some of these Indo-Chinese countries it's really like 
it's almost like the Russia situation in reverse with like there's either just straight pro Western puppets or, you know, pro Chinese military leaders. And that's that's what we're seeing there. But yeah, like this this thing is really getting getting worldwide, you know, Mr. Worldwide. World War Three is going here, you know, Pitbull style. But when it comes to, you know, kind of back to the first front, as it's called, with Russia and Ukraine, Belarus, Lukashenko continues to be the most interesting man involved, I think, even more interesting than Putin. Putin admitted, which this didn't surprise me at all. I guess some Z people may have thought that Putin is, you know, 24-7 talking about the front. But no, Putin has probably four or five semi-hourly calls throughout the day with military leaders. That's how he understands the front. So he he established a little bit of a distinction between him. Maybe that was his attempt politically to distance himself from any mistakes made by the Ministry of Defense. But Lukashenko is not afraid to just tell the world directly what he thinks should happen in the military operation. And a big thing that happened this week was supposedly two Belarusian helicopters flew over the Polish border. I did see pictures supposedly from Poles with Belarusian helicopters right above them. So despite Lukashenko's adamant denial that any of that happened, it may have been it may in fact yell, and now the, the buildup of Wagner of Belarusian troops and of Polish troops along the border is getting more and more active where there's, you know, yelling matches and trash being thrown and, you know, not to mention the whole migrant situation. So that's really heating up. And even Latvia and Lithuania are moving troops to their border region, I think, due to rumors about the Sulawaki corridor. And all of this comes in the midst of this unmanned nautical vehicle attack on this Russian tanker near the Kerch Bridge. And that's also after this entire week, the Ukrainians have upped their attacks on Russian civilians. They've attacked civilian buildings in Moscow. They've attacked more and more civilian areas within the Donbass. We saw a huge strike. I saw it was a very clear and close video of a strike on the Donetsk uh, like internal ministry building in Donetsk where there's a huge explosion. So the Ukrainians are definitely increasing the terrorism despite minimal gains made across the front lines and even attempts at lying, spreading misinformation about breakthroughs and whatnot. So, of course, it's heating up in Russia, Ukraine. The Black Sea continues to be a Russian lake, although we're seeing rumors that even Israeli and U.S. forces and intelligence are helping certain ships make it through. Ukraine, of course, what they're doing with this attack on this Russian tanker is they're trying to go tit for tat on the insurance issue because none of these Western or Ukrainian insurance companies are insuring Ukrainian boats because they know they're going to get shot down by Russians. But Ukraine is trying to do the same for Russian boats that are trying to make it to places like Syria, places like Georgia, other places that may have, you know, be, apt to be operating on the Black Sea coast that Russia could, you know, with Mediterranean coast that Russia could have access to. So the civilian, and like you said before, energy aspect of this continues to increase. Dimitri, I'm wondering your thoughts on the continued bombardment of Odessa, the whole Belarus situation. Like what's the, what's the prognosis here as we move towards that set, that date of, you know, Strelkov's initial trial, you know, that's not going to be our main deadline we focus on, but you know, as that September date comes along, what are we, what are we in store for? Well, well I think those people who have said that Wagner was moving more or less permanently to Belarus have been correct. You know, they've shown us Wagner has developed new flags. Um, they look really based. Uh, they have you know, soldiers and helmets on them. Of course, in this, on the side of the flag, there is that same old uh, skull of the sharp teeth and the crosshairs. So Wagner is putting up flags around Belarus. You know, there are great photos from the new base, et cetera. Like they are spreading their propaganda far and wide. And Belarusians, I think, are quite on one hand uh probably a little bit um scared of what's exactly happening in their country especially considering recent news of, of the wagner soldier committing uh, not even sure how to say the multiple but is murdering six people in a russian village uh up north in karelia so he returned home released from his sentence and unfortunately murdered six people in the northern uh in his village of karelia he was of course a criminal who was recruited into wagner from one of the prisons and of course police have captured him so he's uh currently uh, going to be facing trial again just another symptom i guess of the sickness uh in, in these societies of course this criminal probably served served wagner loyally but in the end of course his uh his his uh sort of mental state was probably just unstable to the point where you know uh, i believe it was at least one and a half families were murdered uh, up north which is probably a, what you could call almost a mass killing in fact and we don't see many mass shootings in russia so kind of unusual sort of situation so of course belarusians seeing that will be a little bit uh a little bit on on the edge but those of course who understand the geopolitics of the situation they actually realize belarus for the first time has received an actual 
powerful military since since the since its um I guess separation or I guess the, since the dissolution of the Soviet Union for the first time Belarus is actually safe and not just safe but as you mentioned it's its neighbors are the ones scared of Belarus it's not like Belarus is afraid of Poland Lithuania Latvia or Estonia it's actually its neighbors who are actually worried right now at the moment You're powering up their essentially spending their spending their money on beefing up these defenses along the borders when Lukashenko has you know, yes, he's used some rhetorical tactics and he's mentioned the fact that, you know, yeah, sure, we could march on Warsaw or whatever, you know, take this, this Walkie Corridor is like a big theme because, um, right, to to get to uh, f f former Konigsberg, Russia needs to use this corridor. And there are these, of course, threats, but nevertheless, I think the, the, the Western side, those countries in NATO are the ones actually threatened and the ones... Um, Aren't really stressed out at the moment, so I, I think the Belarus is uh, only benefiting. Um, re in re regarding the civil uh, civil terrorism ongoing in the in the Kerch Straits as well as in um, just just across Russia with the drones hitting Moscow, I think it's just the uh, it's sort of the escalation of the conflict into not a total war like scenario where we saw in World War Two, but of course civilians became involved and people started joining militias. When of course militias are being built. In, in regions such as Bryansk and Belgorod. Uh, there are officially uh, eight, eight, uh, eight uh, battalions that are built officially. They, have, they, they were given vehicles, one per battalion. They were given some light weapons, for example, uh, sniper rifles, assault rifles, in order to defend those two regions from Ukrainian incursions, but nothing very powerful, like nothing equivalent to what was given to Wagner in its own time. So Bryansk and Belgorod are being protected by local militiamen, essentially. Of course, there are huge legal concerns regarding the, the weapons that can be given to these civilian volunteers, because again, in Russia, the, the weapon laws aren't as, uh, say, liberal as that in the United States of the Second Amendment. So there are these, of course, strict considerations like, well, what if a few AK-47s go missing, you know, sniper rifles and, God forbid, grenades or something of that matter. So, of course, uh, the Russian government is kind of working its way around setting up proper militias in these regions bordering Ukraine in case the Ukrainians try any more terrorist acts. But, it, yeah, it's quite horrible. Like, having having an oil tank, it's not even about the oil or the, the tanker. Like the tanker is the servicemen working on it. Like, if you have blue-collar family members, people who work in, you know, in the, in the oil industry or people who lay bricks or just do physical labor in general, you have to consider those driving these ships, those participating, those working on these oil rigs, they're civilians. They're not military. They're not... They don't have any military contracts. They've never served the Russian military nor the Ukrainian military. They're completely innocent. And in fact, you have, you know, drones of explosive hitting them and putting their lives at risk. And some of them may even pass, you know, dying, unfortunately. It's just something that needs to be considered. This is a, an attack upon civilians is an escalation, which Ukraine has been pushing Russia towards this, this entire time. And of course, both sides have attacked civilians unintentionally and accidentally, but the Ukraine seems to be, of course, always taking the edge, always, you know, getting a bit more, um, getting a bit more in, in your face. And yeah, sure, may, they may be doing it because of insurance, but the, the theme is that, hey, my uncle or my grandfather or the, the man who lives down that street who works on these oil tankers, suddenly he died because a Ukrainian drone hit his ship and suddenly you know, the entire Russian suburb from in Moscow, whichever Rostov, whichever city that the person was from, is suddenly very, very pro-Putin, very pro-Russian, pro-Kremlin, and of course pro-SMO. So this is how you gather support for this uh, sort of warfare. From the Ukrainian perspective, this is really, really bad and unfortunate. I'm not sure what they're trying to win from attacking civilian ships and, of course, civilian, the, the Kerch Bridge. Now the tanker, I mean, uh, where is it going to end? Or well, crashing these drones into Moscow, sure. Some of them may hit the Ministry of Defense buildings, but others are hitting just, uh, you know, unfortunate civilians in apartments. It's it's just the never-ending. Again, this is, it could be labeled terrorism, and I think it should be officially. Of course, Western Western powers won't be doing that. But uh, for, for us Russians, it is considered uh, just a form of barbarism. Yeah, I think, and again, I'm not trying to, def uh, last thing I'm going to do on here is defend the Kiev regime, but people just need to look at this from a, from a military political strategy perspective. Russia has very little to gain from any kind of targeting of civilians. I'm, I'm talking just objectively here. Like, like the, if they want to occupy more of this territory, if they want to incorporate some of this, you know, territory from a country with a very much lower GDP per capita than their current, population they're going to need to preserve as much infrastructure as possible not kill people that may want to live in these places whereas ukraine like they're going for broke here like they they see the only they see one of the only viable tactics to drive out the quote-unquote regime that's been in power specifically in donetsk and luhansk for you know a decade now they've seen 
they see the only way to drive them out is to just stoke complete terror, complete lack of confidence in the safety of the people who have, like the millions of people that have held out in these regions now for, for years. So from a strictly just kind of strategy perspective, it makes perfect sense why Ukraine would be the ones targeting civilians. But as far as the actual, like, on the ground situation about like living in these places like again, odessa keeps coming back into play russia continues to conduct precision strikes along the border with romania uh, like the like multiple of these ships have been now destroyed in like you know all sorts of you know even uh grain shipping ships have been destroyed by the russians you know again these ports are totally unusable right now the grain deal has been terminated uh, like someone like erdogan erdogan's been freaking out about the grain deal because he wants that money but uh, when it comes, we recently talked about the cathedral in Odessa last week, and I'm sure Dmitry have even more details. One of the main manifestations of, I think, the flailing Kiev regime is their persecution of the Ukrainian church. And we've seen some beautiful footage from all night vigils and whatnot hosted by Metropolitan Onufri, and the strength and the numbers still being shown at the cathedrals held by the canonical Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate. Dmitry, what is the current state of the canonical church? And how is how is that going for everybody? I think generally speaking, the church in Ukraine at the moment it's facing uh, it's facing very different opinions from from various regions. So we do have uh, you know reports of of a parish actually going into schism in the last week. So if we're talking about new news in the Vinitsk diocese in western U uh, Ukraine, an entire parish went into schism on the thirty first of July. So the priest essentially just said, look. Um, I, I, I like Metropolitan Onufri, but we have to work to unite these two churches in Ukraine, so I'll be joining the OCU on the Metropolitan Epiphany. And he was officially excommunicated by the Ukrainian Council of Bishops, and they actually signed, they banned him from communion, and they, of course, excommunicated, excommunicated him according to the canons of the Holy Apostles, you know, rules 10, 11, 39, and the second rule of the Council of Antioch for leading his uh, parish into schism, in, primarily for being a sort of schismatic heresiarch himself so the leader of a schism of course takes the majority of the of the blame for leading his pattern and this is of course what the saints have you know, condemned very heavily is that you know do not lead your flock astray which is what he's done so there's there's that of course unfortunate piece of news right before august here and uh again in terms of other bad things happening in, in odessa necessarily we we did hear about that transfiguring transfiguration cathedral the largest cathedral in odessa hit on the 23rd of july 2023 now we did speak about it last week but more news developed now metropolitan agafangel of odessa the leading bishop of odessa the, of course he's canonical as well 84 years of age has openly condemned russia it's he called russia barbaric and he said the smo was an anti-human operation and a war against ukraine that the ukrainians need to stand up and fight russia you know to protect themselves it's like we have a, an actual official metropolitan of the ukrainian orthodox church a very senior one 84 years old uh, and of course, he started not not just that. It's not just the sermon that he gave, but he also began spreading prayer books, Malitva Slova, with uh, prayers for Ukrainian troops for the Ukrainian for the Ukrainian military in particular. So, uh, photographs of those prayer books started appearing online again. It's very uh, very unfortunate news. And he's of course still has grace and is still canonical. But Metropolitan Agafangel actually believed that Russia did hit this Transfiguration Cathedral, whether or not Russia did or did not hit it. It's most likely that it, it, it wasn't in fact the Russian missile because the missile probably would have destroyed the entire cathedral, to be honest, in my in my particular opinion. So it was most likely a Ukrainian anti-air missile which went uh, off course and struck the, the roof of the cathedral and it caused significant damage, but in fact the cathedral still stands. And allegedly, based on news off the ground, none of the big uh, historical icons were damaged. So the iconography on the walls was damaged, but of course none of the icons were necessarily destroyed in the... Uh, in the explosion, which is good. Um, and the the local deacon, uh, Father Eugene, uh, again, of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, completely canonical, released this really emotional video, which just uh, appeared a couple of days ago, in fact. And he just said, look, the, the Russians are barbarians, they're destroying my cathedral, this is where I served. And he released this really emotional video, right? So how did, interesting, uh, another character, another, this, this I guess, Gigich hat of the Ukrainian church appears to address this emotional outcry of Father Eugene, Metropolitan Luke of Zaporozhye. And uh, like, why do I refer to him as a Gigich hat? As he was the first bishop of the Ukrainian church to openly anathematize Zelensky in uh, late 2022. Remember that? I think it was before even 
before the Western Christmas came around, there was an anathema for Zelensky that came out from Bishop Luke. He's in Melitopol at the moment. His official seat in is, is, is in Ukrainian um, occupied Zaporozhye. So Metropolitan Luke released the video where he says, look, Father Eugene, uh, you can't call these Russians and humans and barbarians. We have to pray for them. Uh, you know, Christ never damned and cursed those people who were crucifying him on the cross. So in fact, if you want to be like Christ and you're a deacon serving in the church, you, you either stop being a deacon and you take off your cross or you keep it on and actually act accordingly, stop being emotional. Very strong words. Again, you can kind of understand both sides here, but uh, Metropolitan Luke, of all his wisdom, uh, he kind of gave that advice to Father Eugene. And mind you, Metropolitan Luke is in eastern Ukraine. Father Eugene is far away in the west. Again, uh, very different opinions in the Ukrainian church as to what's ex what exactly is going on. Metropolitan Luke, interestingly, in that same in that same Q and A session where he um, he released this in a video, this video address, he did answer the question on autocephaly: Should the Ukrainian church seek autocephaly? He says, "Well, autocephaly historically has been sought simply for promotion of missionary work as well as evangelization of the particular population." Uh, of the country which uh, has received autocephaly in the first place. So it's autocephaly is uh, not a goal in and of itself. It, the goal is to spread the word of God and how to, autocephaly needs to address that in some positive way. And in, and he says, what stops us from spreading the word of God in Ukraine today? Ukraine has a lot of neo-Nazis, a lot of, and neo-Nazis, I mean, pagans, liberal general, degenerates, all kinds of bizarre uh, Western teachings, and as well as uh, even Eastern, the Eastern teaching of Buddhists, new age religions. Why can't the Ukrainian church mission provide missionary work now without autocephaly? And he says it can. He says all this talk about autocephaly is completely useless and it shouldn't be pursued at the moment, at least in Ukraine. So that's his particular opinion, which, again, I think I personally agree with. I know some people in the church and even uh, in the Orthodox community on Twitter want to see Ukraine as a more independent church. But I'm more of the opinion of, you know, St. Lawrence of Chernigov and the elders of Donbass, who of course spoke out in unity concerning the unity of Ukraine and Russia. So, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a mix of opinions right now on how exactly the SML is going. Metropolitan Anufri, uh, of course, was speaking about these clergymen giving various adamant statements about what's going on in the world at the moment spiritually. And Metropolitan Anufri released a four minute sermon where he addresses the question of abortion. Funny enough, it's like, I mean, abortion is legal in Ukraine, and Zelensky you know, is a big liberal, so in fact, it's almost like a critical video of Zelensky, and he says euthanasia is of the devil, he says abortion, again, is of the devil itself, it's just all these anti-depopulation, these depopulation strategies, he kind of spoke in an almost anti-Bill Gatesian fashion. It's Mr. Poulton and Ufri, it's not, and this is on the thirty on the 31st of July, this video was published, I believe, on the, on the 30th, but he speaks about this global agenda of depopulation. It's almost like an anti-vax talk of sorts, which is incredibly based. And uh, he condemns all of these things. And again, the one, the other thing he mentioned is he says depopulation is also promoted by the alphabet community and same-sex marriage. So he condemns that too. And this is while Zelensky is talking about growing weed in Crimea and promoting gay marriage and LGBT parades in Kiev and all this bizarre stuff. And Mitch Bolton and is like, uh, guess what? This is what the church stands on. These questions here, not the degeneracy you hear about in the Verkhovne Rada or uh, in the executive branches of Ukraine. So it's kind of giving the Ukrainians a second, like not, they don't have to look towards the Kremlin for a right-wing opinion. They have one internally, which I guess is a great thing. So uh, there are good news and, you know, there are unfortunate news in, in exactly what's happening on the ground. But again, it's there's a lot of emotion, naturally speaking, as there would be during a, a war and a special military operation. I guess now we can actually op openly call it a conflict because Putin has, for the first time uh, this week, called it an, a conflict between brotherly nations. So, uh, and he even said a military conflict. So he's actually, it's almost, it's not a special military operation anymore. The rhetoric has been upgraded. And now we're almost at this, at Patriot Kirill's level where he calls it a, almost a holy war. Um, we're almost there. So yeah, it, you know, things are, things are improving in some, in some ways and getting worse in others. Well, it's really important that you bring up Metropolitan Luke because we've talked about this before, but for better or for worse on a lot of these issues, those hierarchs who are consistently on, on the Orthodox side of things against the world on the right side of these issues, they, they kind of, they, they, they hit the dubs across the board in a lot of ways. Metropolitan Luke, he himself is a medical doctor. He spoke out against the potential dangers of, you know, the mRNA vaccinations and whatnot, you know, and that's in certain parts of Russia, that wasn't always the most popular opinion, but we're seeing 
and again, I'm not trying to get too, you know, dramatic or again, my prognosis of the church is, means nothing. I'm just a simple layman. But again, just remember, I think in many ways, this schism is the, one of the biggest things dividing the Orthodox world right now, you know, for, for, for over five years now, it's been dividing the Greek and Russian worlds, which are kind of the two main institutional pillars of world orthodoxy. And I mean, I'll just say it, I think in many ways, that's part of, it's part of why the special military operation is going on in God in many ways, as I've said it before, the more and more parishes and territory gets behind the Russian front lines, the more and more are like fully secured against the presence of schismatics. And I'm, I think in many ways, God realized what was going on in the ground and said, look, I think I need to, this needs to be resolved by me. Like I'm taking this into my own hands, you know, even in many ways, a lot of the bishops failed to achieve unity. And so now God is allowing it to be resolved by other means. So I think that's true. And that's one of the main reasons you need to keep this in your prayers. And this all ties into, I mean, just the general kind, I mean, to put, you talk about the statements by Metropolitan and Free and how that people in Ukraine are now able to have this actual Christian opinion and not, I guess you could say, feel pressure to just get their news or information from Russian sources that go against that. But it's important to remember, like, look, Epiphany Domenko, the fake Metropolitan in the past, he made the exact statement, we have to soften on LGBT issues to not be like the Russian church. And remember, these issues are not popular across Ukraine. Ukraine is a Slavic, Eastern European, Orthodox nation. They have no interest in any of this kind of stuff, but the Westernization is coming in. And more and more people, like, I think will realize what's going on as the Kiev regime gets demoralized. And we saw some talk today about like, you know, as these military regimes in certain countries get demoralized, eventually the people just kind of eat them from within. And I think that's basically how much they've doubled down on this Crimea stuff. You know, how much, you know, they now have that transgender person, Carrillo or whatever that Greek's name is, releasing those statements about Gonzalo Lira, you know, hope... You know, we're following the Gonzalo Lira situation too, but I mean, they're just running full on into Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think when the jig finally is up, that a lot of these, there's, there might just be a straight up, you know, the Ukrainians might just storm their own buildings and drag some of these people out. And I'm not going to say what may happen, but it very well may not be pretty. Yeah, that's right. And as, as we see Ukraine sort of on, on a secular basis, at least its military forces, uh, for those who, who aren't aware, the actual Ukrainian Orthodox Church is banned from having its official clergyman. So the UOC MP does not have any military clergyman in the Ukrainian army, only on volunteer basis. So they're not allowed to cooperate with the Ukrainian military. The only church official sanctioned are those from the OCU, from the church, you know, from the fake church of fake Metropolitan Epiphany. Which is very curious, right? Which, um, again, it speaks volumes as to who exactly Zelensky and his administration trust. They trust their pocket church, which they created, you know, only in the last eight years during the schism. So, again, it kind of paints this really clear picture as to who the bad guys and the good guys are, you know, uh, sort of colloquially speaking here. Um, now, of course, the Russian church is having its own internal internal issues, whereas, or as, as in, like, for example, we saw Metropolitan Hilarion uh, exiled to Hungary at the beginning of... Um, you know the SMO, which he was essentially was viewed as almost the uh, the successor to Patriarch Kirill, and we haven't really heard much from him except recently in the last month he actually appeared on a few conferences against the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and he spoke openly actually against the Ecumenical Patriarch um, in a very very powerful way because he is usually viewed as this left wing, no, not a left wing, but more or less a soft sort of bishop on these particular left wing issues. But he spoke very powerfully in, in favor of the Russian church, which um, I'm not sure exactly why they gave him the mic again, but they did. So uh, maybe he's coming back into the fold. We'll see. And uh, again, big, uh, big sort of question marks arising from the recent hierarchical council that took place in Moscow. Just we did speak about it two weeks ago, but there are these these interesting details, which you know, it did occur. On, it did occur on the 19th of July. But uh, notice the Metropolitan of Chisinau and Moldova actually did not attend the council, even though he was invited and he's officially one of the more the more senior bishops of the Russian Church. He simply didn't attend. So uh, there's these almost like a perception, like a uh, not PR wise, but you could say an almost this you could say an almost uh, perception amongst locals, perhaps his parishioners in Moldova. Um, they don't have the same attitudes towards the SMO as maybe the people in Russia or the Ukraine do. Perhaps they don't want to choose a side and they're like, look, uh, Vladika, how about you don't travel to this council where you know they're going to pray for victory of the Russian forces. And so he just didn't go. And the other metropolitan who even even more adamantly, again, we're speaking about energy in Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan's kind of middle ground 
you know, it, does, it extends to the church. Kazakhstan sort of not anti-Russian, but this neutrality which it has chosen chosen for itself under Takayev and uh, the previous president as well. Metropolitan Alexander Vastana in Kazakhstan actually did attend the did attend the council in Moscow, but he didn't attend the liturgy. So he simply didn't attend the liturgy, and he went through his own private liturgy, and he said, I mean, this wasn't the official reason, but the suspected reason is that it's because there all the Russian hierarchs, the 100-plus Russian bishops were praying for the victory of Russia, all collectively, and he didn't want to participate in that because, maybe because it would have some sort of impact on Kazakhstan and on his on his the members of his particular local diocese there you know maybe the opinions differ like maybe he doesn't exactly agree with the smo so we do see this difference uh, here amongst bishops it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there's there are local schisms going on but we do have to keep in mind that you know these differences do exist in the church and you know it, in a way you could say almost like a theologumenon on a collective scale in this particular smo war in fact but we do understand according to you know to what to what the saints have said, especially in the last 100 years, there is definitely no way anybody would side with the regime of Zelensky and what's happening, at least on that particular side, because you know the promotion of degeneracy, Conrad mentioned, just the, the fact that the West is pouring like just these libations of degenerate culture onto the Ukrainian people, essentially sprinkling them like, you know, sprinkling them with unholy water, unlike the recent uh, anti-LGBT parade in Romania, which was sprinkling the, the, the streets mm -hmm. after the LGBT parade has walked them in bucharest with holy water just kind of cleansing it and we see the west sprinkling on holy water all over ukraine essentially desecrating it for its own for its own purposes and not just for military tech and all these ideologies but culturally and religiously uh, it's uh it's what we speak about here on the podcast quite often and it's what the majority of the prophecies are about it's about you know just not allowing the, this particular country, this uh, heartland of orthodoxy in Eastern Europe, to fall to what we what you call collectively as the dark side or the side of Satan, the Antichrist. And this really ties in, I think, with we've talked a lot about Strelkov's arrest and kind of the perspective of that in Russia. And it's so important, I think, that again, voices like his and voices like him that maybe also aren't as critical of, of the Russian MOD per se is important to have their voices because they are the people that are going to maintain that perspective of anti-degeneracy, pro-orthodoxy as the forefront of kind of the Russian civilizational vision right now as they push into this new territory. And it also ties in, in my opinion, back to the stuff we were talking about with the anti-white stuff. It's people like Strelkov and these other characters are not, they're not itching to ally themselves with these, you know, communistic or even certain places, Muslim, you know, regimes just for the sake of multipolarity i don't even i think that the struggle in south africa the real multipolar force are the boer people just based on the history of the conflict there i mean look just read winston churchill he said that he was crying and pooping his pants when he pressured as a, when he was a war correspondent and he pressured his group down there in the boer wars to enter into boer territory and they almost died i mean he said he heard the boers singing psalms over the hills and felt that he was going to die because he knew that they were fighting for something they believed in in their land and that he was just there for this imperial war of you know cultural and economic control and of course now i, I recommend everyone follow willem petzer afroforum some of these other forces so these other sources that cover the plight of the boar and everything going on there but again people like strelkov these other voices in russia these are the people that if they're if they were brought to power if their voices were listened to in the kremlin you know we wouldn't have as much of the, you know, quote unquote, coal posting as we may or may not sometimes see. And again, I know, the Z, of course, most Z people don't like Strelkov just because of his criticism of that. And again, Dmitry and I are in some agreement there, but it, it, this is civilizational. And without a clear civilizational vision, Russia is going to falter more than it could to achieve what it needs to achieve. Because again, we believe that everything happens by the will of God, and God is clearly pushing the world in a direction that he wants it to go for the sake of spreading the gospel. And there again, we've said that on just listen to the ether hours about the Russian elite, there are just moneyed forces in Russia that have a vested interest in not doing that. And we, he, we seek to expose those people and just do whatever we can to center, I guess, the civilizational vision and make sure that people, at the same time, though, make sure that people don't despair when you know, human forces try to derail that because ultimately it's God who's going to have the last word. In fact, I don't think there's any room for despair. I think, it, if anything, people should be hopeful. And that's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is, of course, love, hope, 
we need to we need to be hopeful that Christ is working in the world. Things are going according to the Holy Spirit and God's God's actions in the world. Things don't just happen by themselves. Not not everything is run by the Illuminati or the bankers or those people you know <laughs> who run things and push you know. All their plans, for, they can build them very meticulously, but they will they will all fall apart, and things will fall into place as God will will it. And uh, this is what we saw in 2014, and during the Russian Spring, which you know people like Jackson Hinkle and all these other um, Z patriots on Twitter need to speak about more. There's, the Russian Spring was mostly an Orthodox uprising, and Strelkov, people like Strelkov, Givi Motorola, these were all very Orthodox Christians who participated in that particular event. It is. This uh, uplifting, uh, you know, this, uh, essentially you can call it a military uprising, but in fact, I think it was more, more just a collective regional uprising against the degeneracy in Kiev, in Ukraine, and in the world itself. It's just these Russians, Russian patriots, coming together and uh, hoping, hoping for a brighter future for their particular regions. They were supported by the monastery folk and everybody around as well. So. Again, everything according to the prophecies given to us by the saints. So that doesn't necessarily, you know, um, that shouldn't cause despair for anybody. If anything, all of these, I guess some of these news, and you may listen to these news maybe once a week or maybe every day, maybe every hour, but uh, you do need to keep in mind that if, if because things are, things are happening, it should be, it should, of course, promote hope rather than despair only because if things were not happening and we were just sliding slowly into degeneracy and there was no particular opposition to it around the world, then I think that that would be a lot more depressing, at least from my particular perspective. No, again, we are we despair over the violence and the kind of unfortunate course that the world has had to take to get to where it needs to go. But at the same time, again, we're grateful that, you know, people always say nothing ever happens is what is the truth. But like, that's bad. Like, we don't want the current status quo of the regime to stagnate and just completely enculturate the world. We believe that what we're seeing now, this resistance to you know, what we consider Zog, the beast system, is something to be hopeful for and to direct your prayers towards in a, not for any worldly regime, but for the will of God to be, to be done throughout these great events. Because to dispute that God has used great geopolitical worldly events and wars throughout the history is to just toss the Bible right out. So I think it's really important that people, if you're going to concern yourself with the affairs of the world, this is the perspective you should adopt to not I think drive yourself crazy. But I want to just make it clear as well when it comes to some of these globalism issues, the idea of kind of communist internationalism, you know, multi multipolarity, you know, kind of a global south versus the west and this maybe this false dialectic where the Atlantic global powers are the representatives of quote unquote white culture and then the global south and Asia are representative of the other and just this kind of idea that we all need to you know, we all need to just, all the third world, we all need to mix together with Russia and Central Asia and we'll create this, you know, Eurasian super race or something that people talk about. Like, this is this is not how things need to go. And I just want to read some words of Elder Athanasios Mytilineos, who we're probably in the next few months on Ether Hour eventually going to discuss some of his work. He, you know, is one of the most prominent recent saints and elders to have discussed Revelation itself and even some of its application to the world around us. It could be a good follow-up to our episode with Dean Arnold, be sure to check out episode 10 of Ether Hour to hear our discussion with him. But Elder Athanasios, who passed away in 2006, he was a Greek elder, I believe he's of course a saint, he says, God wants boundaries. All people are descendants of Adam and Eve, but God also created the family unit, and the family unit must have boundaries. If these boundaries become eliminated and strangers come in and out, then the family unit will soon self-destruct. In the same way, our country serves as a macro family, our extended family that God wants each country to have its own boundaries. There's a tendency, however, especially in our times, to jump on the bandwagon of our world market, our world economy, to open our boundaries to every product, every idea, every fashion from all over the world, a phenomenon of internationalism. But it is common knowledge that this unification of the entire world, the elimination of national boundaries, will be the work of the Antichrist. God's will is for different people to live in different countries. God wants boundaries. The monument of Babel was a monument of vain glory, and it was supposed to serve as the reference point of all different nations. But our reference point as creations of God must be God. Everywhere we go, we should have that as our common point, our common reference point as God, the most high God. So I think, you know, there's no Christian imperative to, you know, mix all the peoples of the world. There's no Christian imperative that, you know, I'll just say precludes the idea of a quote unquote ethno state. I think any Greek, you know, would agree with this idea, and I applaud Greeks for maintaining their chauvinism in this regard. But I think it's important to have that kind of, you know, to have that synchronicity of, you know, Christian and national 
you know, pride, chauvinism, and love, so that, you know, the love and energy of the Holy Spirit can be distributed property. We talk a lot about, we've talked a lot about misplaced charity on this show. I think it's a problem you see, especially a lot of times in evangelicalism in America, you know, local cities are crumbling like Sodom and Gomorrah, yet we all need to fly over to Africa, supposedly, to, you know, to do something, to take pictures on a mission trip or whatever. So I think that that love of, of, of your neighbor like that is something that can really help influence society for the better. And I want to, you know, we're going to wrap it up here in a second, but as, as the Russian special military operation continues, we see miracles manifesting. And I think people might've seen it on our telegram, but there was this miracle in this hospital in Krasnogorsk where this image of this kind of outlined image of the Theotokos, which any Orthodox person who's ever seen an icon or has an icon corner would immediately recognize, basically imprinted itself on all the windows of this hospital. And it's a hospital that has a lot of young men from the special military operation. And it seems that, you know, again, it's not that God would display miracles to the other side, but it just seems that, you know, there is comfort being brought towards towards Orthodox soldiers and a kind of this love of people and this national unity is being cultivated in Russia that I think people aren't talking about as much as the worldwide situation, but it's something that is going to be key to the civilizational awakening that I think Russia will be leading in the 21st century. And just a final word uh, for all those, um, of course, in Ukraine and Russia and just around the world, uh, Orthodox Christians who may be familiar with the Piotokos icon of Pachayev today, or at least uh, on the 5th of August, um, it is the feast day of this icon and the Pachayev Monastery in Western Ukraine will be celebrating uh, this most uh, holy miracle working icon of the Piotokos, which has performed so many miracles for us. Of course, Mary, the Mother of God, has appeared in Western Ukraine and has given much hope and love to the people there over the centuries. So this icon is about 500 years old at this point. So the Pachaya Theotokos and many bishops and priests will be there uh, this weekend, actually, this Saturday and Sunday as we're recording. Um, so there'll probably be footage we'll be releasing on our Twitter. And yeah, just a very kind of very good, happy end uh, note to, to end on, I think, in, in all regards, just the one that, look, uh, whatever's happening on the ground, I think the culture is more or less uh, the Orthodox Christianity is is building in these regions, even in those, of course, affected by the war and affected by degenerate ideologies. I think Orthodoxy grows regardless as it grew during the Soviet Union and during Ottoman occupation. It still, still grows today, even under, shall we say, the, the liberal yoke. It's true, and I'll give you the last word, Dimitri, sum up anything else we may have missed about the church, but this was a great episode. We covered a lot of broad World War III stuff, which I really like doing on the show. Sometimes so much stuff happens that we just get caught up in in the specific on-the-ground situations, but this was a good overview. I think we really hit some classic World War Now points. We're going to keep you posted on big things going on in the Black Sea. Next week, we're watching what's going on in Turkey, of course. We're walking, watching what's going on in Niger and some of these other places, the Persian Gulf is heating up so follow us on all the socials this week we'll shout those out in a second but dimitri hit us with anything that we may have missed and something anything that may be relevant to the people yeah so we will be having a weekly a for hour episode of course releasing uh from here on in so definitely stay tuned for those uh for those interested in subscribing to the Substack. it is the best way for you to support myself dimitri and conrad you know we do do this uh just out of the out of passion for the subject matter, for just the fact that we're Orthodox Christians and we can kind of speak openly about these subjects and not be afraid of censorship, just kind of speaking to not just an audience of laymen, but I do believe we do have some clergy in the audience as well. So bless us, please, fathers, and forgive us if we make any mistakes or if we speak out of line, because at the same time, it is a very passionate show. And uh, we do appreciate any guidance. Anybody that has comments or feedback, of course, provide that. But the best way you can support us is subscribing on Substack. It is, um, you do, you don't, it's not just the subscription where you give us money. Of course, you received our E for Hour uncensored episodes where we speak about subjects ranging from those related to orthodoxy to very strictly political uncensored topics you will not hear almost anywhere else on YouTube, at least in the English language, at least not from this perspective. So definitely, and those, of course, keep building up as um so your subscription essentially pays for almost three to four new episodes as well as all of the archived ones on there and we'll be releasing of course new articles relating to issues of warfare and orthodoxy as well as um, some of my personal opinions on communism so again communism appearing with jackson hinkle and infrared haas and if you don't know who these names and people are essentially they're patriotic right-wing influences on the internet on twitter in particular and on telegram who promote 
socialistic, communistic ideas who me and Conrad have interacted with in the past and essentially promoting communism to young people. And which, of course, you may find, find abhorrent and strange because it's like, well, haven't we dealt with this beast in the past? Don't we have this huge array of new martyrs? Well, no, essentially, unfortunately, a lot of this content hasn't been, a lot of the anti-communist statements of the saints have simply not been translated into English. So I'll be conducting that. Uh, those releases over the next few months, essentially releasing articles about of our saints, essentially condemning communism, and speaking about it, you know, very frankly, and just exploring that particular subject. For those interested, again, feel free to subscribe, feel free to support us on our Twitter, follow Conrad, myself, and World War Now. I, again, uh, you know, it's just these multi this multi platform approaches. I think the best way to go ahead. Yeah, I think World War Now Substack.com. Obviously, that's where you can find all of us doing. Everything that we do, again, Dimitri's got a lot of articles coming out. Every episode of Ether Hour, you know, we've gotten big rave reviews on the most recent episodes, so be sure to check those out. Uh, follow us on Twitter, World War Now underscore. Follow me on Twitter at GnomeRad. Follow Dimitri on Twitter at OCanonist. Uh, be sure to follow us on Telegram, World War Now Telly. All of our videos are up on Rumble now, so be sure to check those out. Uh, follow us on Rumble if you want to support us there. We, you know, eventually we'll probably figure out how to stream there as well. I think it's a good backup to have if you know, YouTube shuts us down or anything. I don't think Substack will shut us down, but if somehow that happened, you know, we'd still have Rumble. So check us out there, World War Now. And yeah, this week, you know, it was great. I'm looking hopeful for America. The Antiochian Convention has wrapped up. Metropolitan Saba seems that we're going to have some monasteries in the near future in America. So God bless that. Keep that in your prayers. Pray for all of us here. And again, we've got a lot of things to be covered this week. Follow us on the socials to keep up with it. And we'll see you next time. God bless. God bless, guys.